it is time to uh, uh, tape our first lesson for advanced ministerial internship, the ordination class. Glad to be with you, and uh, hopefully, hopefully this will be a beneficial class to you. I know that it will. It's got some great stuff in it, great reading. I want to share some things with you that I think will be beneficial. And so, uh, as promised, I'm beginning the teaching on it this week. So, um, what I want you to do is I want you to make sure you get your syllabus in hand before you go any further. You can pause it mid if you need to and get your syllabus in hand so that we can go over the syllabus together and, uh, and I can help you process this course. And uh, let me say as well that I'm going to do my best and I think now that I've got this on track and I have enough people interested, we have a number of people taking the course that, uh, I, I mean, I don't know exactly how many, five, six, something like that, uh, that um, I'll be able to stay on track. And a couple of you just need a couple classes. That's why we started with these classes first. And, uh, and uh, this one and then the next one. And then uh, we'll keep on going. So... Um, I'm going to do my best to get you through these courses and help you to get your schooling for your um, ordination, uh, whether or not you're at that place as far as ministry-wise to get your ordination, at least you can get the schooling taken care of, which is what we're going to do right now. And um, so let's have a word of prayer and just ask God's blessing. Father, we thank you. Holy Spirit, for what you're doing in our lives, we thank you for teaching us and leading us and guiding us. I thank you for these men and women who have dedicated themselves to the kingdom, dedicated themselves to follow you and your purpose and plan. And I thank you for the privilege of being able to pour into their life and, and be a resource for them to help them uh, navigate the landmines of ministry and uh, learn some things in the classroom that hopefully they won't have to learn uh, on the battlefield because uh, we can avoid some of the pitfalls as we as we learn how to operate in the kingdom. So bless this time together, I pray. Anoint this teaching and help us to grow together in faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, what I want you to do is get your syllabus, as I said. I want to go over the syllabus with you. And uh, so you know what's required of you. Uh, the course description, of course, of Advanced Ministerial Internship. This course focuses on the three attributes of the heart of ministry. Characteristics to be avoided and tests that must be passed in the life of the ministry. Basic areas of pastoral counseling. And other skills needed to be a successful pastor. In other words, in order to be a successful pastor, there's various skills. There's no one way to do church. There's no one way to pastor. God will use your skills, your gifts, your abilities, and he'll use them for his kingdom. Uh, this is a requirement that meets both the GSA, GSO and core curriculum requirements as well as credentialing requirements for the Assemblies of God. Here's your course objectives. Upon successful completion of this course, individuals will be able to Understand the purpose of the local church in today's society. Build a structure inside of themselves to lead the local church. Grow the local church into a family that can affect the society in practical ways. Know how to reproduce themselves in order to develop leaders around them. Develop their own leadership style. Engage God's presence in order to gain a deeper relationship with Him and allow Him to deposit vision into their spirit and turn a vision into action. The required reading, uh, first of all, is Bill Hybel's book, uh, Courageous Leadership. Now let me just share with you, hopefully you've got it already, um, and hopefully you can see that it's not showing up too well, is it? Courageous Leadership. Hopefully you already have it. If not, you need to get it ASAP. And uh, let me just uh, fill you in for those of you that may not be familiar with Bill Hybels, though probably you are. He is uh, a seeker-sensitive pastor, uh, and yet he has a heart for people, a heart for ministry, a heart for seeing lives changed, and he's got a lot of good information. While I would never be able to uh, conduct services the way he does and pastor in the way he does, uh, I've learned a lot from following his heart, and um, so it's a very good book, Courageous Leadership. 
and then of course the Bible will you know you'll be looking at throughout the the uh, the, the module course requirements course attendance and participation since this is a form of a directed study course what I mean by that is directed study course is basically I give you the syllabus you get the books you do work you send it to me this is a form of that but not completely that because we are going to have a couple of videos uh, teaching videos that's going to help as well the students to finish the coursework within the next five weeks and if input or direction for the instructor is needed you need to contact me via the internet best way to get a hold of me uh, you'll see on the back page is a, a phone number and my internet address my email address while you can call Oftentimes, the quickest way to get a hold of me is through the email because uh, once you call or text and I've listened to it, it doesn't show me I've got one and it might be two weeks before I get back to it with my schedule. But if you email me, even if it takes a little while for me to get back to you, at least I work off my emails. Periodically, I'll sit down and I'll just go to my different email accounts uh, for the different schools, etc., and start working on them. Uh, so that's the easiest way. Final exam. The exam will consist of material presented in reading and other course experiences. It will be sent to you at the end of the five-week period, and it's going to cover the textbook reading as well as information we discuss in class. An assignment. The students to prepare a six- to eight-page double-spaced paper on the subject, My Philosophy of Ministry. This paper is to share in detail how the student views ministry as a whole, and their particular calling specifically. It should include not only understanding of their ministry and vision for the future, but should also share specifically how the student plans to carry out their vision. Uh, course grading will be based on the following percentages. Your final exam is 40% of your grade. Your reading assignments, uh, making sure you read the book and other assignments is 20%, and your written paper is 40% of the grade. A uh, little paragraph there on plagiarism, do your own work, um, and then the contact information at the bottom. So um, that being said, uh, it, it's pretty self-explanatory, I think, what, the, uh, what we're requiring in this class. If you have any questions on that, for more clarification, email me, and I'll be happy to, uh, to help you process that and get in touch with you on that. And so... Uh, so let me, uh, uh, what I want to do today is I just want to give you some introductory stuff. I just want to share some stuff from my heart. I want to share a few things from other, um, from other uh, uh, sources. Um, and, uh, and, and so, um, uh, you know, just, just to get you started here. So um, one thing I want to do right now is go to the table of contents in your book, Courageous Leadership. Because one of the things I want you to do within the next next uh, two weeks is to try to read this book if possible, or at least the majority of it, because that's going to connect into our assignment that I have for you at the end of the class. And um, I'm just going to briefly go over a few things in the uh, table of contents. And there's a lot of good information in this book. Do I agree with everything? No. Uh, do I think some of it's outdated? Of course. If you write a book uh, in 2015 on ministry, in, in 2016, some of it will be outdated because our society is moving on. The problem is our society moves on. The people we're trying to reach move on. And if we don't move on to some degree, we can never connect with them. So so uh, the stakes of leadership is, uh, is uh, chapter one, the, uh, uh, the leader's most potent weapon. Chapter 2, which is the power of vision. And I have some... Um, I have some different perspectives on vision than some people do. Uh, I know that uh, Proverbs 29, 18, without a vision people perish, or as some translations say, they cast off restraint. Uh, what does that mean? It means that vision helps us stay focused. It helps us uh, uh, stay self um, what's the word I want? Uh, disciplined. Uh, because we have a vision, we have a purpose, we're not carried here and there and here and there. We have to have a vision. And, uh, and a vision can be a powerful thing. And I think one of the problems with, with uh, 
some pastors is um, they don't have a vision. Their vision is having church on Sunday morning, uh, visiting people in the hospital, and hoping we grow and make it. Uh, I think others have a very detailed vision, even to the point of uh, their vision will supersede uh, where God may be wanting to take them and supersede the direction of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Um, so I think we need to, and I think another problem sometimes with vision and ministry is that pastors do have vision on the inside of them, but because of their makeup, because of the way they grew up, because of the way they process things, they can't articulate. They have a hard time articulating the vision. And uh, a person like that needs somebody close to them who is vision-minded that can sit down with them with a pad and a pe pencil and talk to that pastor and pull out of that pastor what's on the inside of them and try to put it down in some logical sequence on paper so that a vision can be developed from it. In other words, they have vision. They just don't know how to articulate it. They don't know how to, to present it. They don't know how to... Uh, develop all programs around it. Uh, as an example, when it comes to ministry, everything you do in a church service, everything you do in your weekly schedule, everything you do in your church should have a reason. You don't just do it. There's a reason and a purpose for why you're doing it. And I think too many pastors don't have that. So, so number one, uh, yes, we do need a vision. Uh, and his stuff is good on that. But number two, uh, let me let me just quickly share a little thought, and this will get your thinking going. That one time God spoke to me, and this is after I was. It's when I was between pastorates. It was a nine-year period when I had left the Bay Area as pastor, went to a, a, a as you know a church, and was the director of a Bible school. And uh, the more recently, like three and a half years ago, I began pastoring again. But during that nine-year period when I wasn't, God was able to speak to me some things about life and ministry and even vision that probably I couldn't have heard if I was in the midst of the struggle. And one day God spoke to me and he said, uh, let me talk to you about vision for a minute. And he said, "He said, you know, you, you've, you've heard you got to have a vision. You've got to develop a vision. You've got to present your vision. Church has to focus around a vision. And he said, but what I'm, but he said, but, but many of my leaders <clears throat> have developed a vision, but it's their vision, not necessarily my vision. And so he said, let, he, I just felt like he said it to me this way. Here's a novel idea. How about looking at the resources that I've given you and develop a vision from those resources? And when he said that, when the word resources came to me, I saw people. People are resources to get the ministry done. And he said, how about looking at the resources I've given you, the people that I've given you, and begin to build a vision around them, their gifts, their abilities, their personalities, so that together the church can function. And I think there's a, a, a great way to, uh, to, to, to look at that. So it's a great way to look at it. So just another thought. So uh, chapter uh, 3 uh, is getting it done, leadership getting it done, leadership, and um, um, uh, it's talking about uh, turning vision into action. See, that's one thing you have to understand, that vision itself is not enough. You have to act on the vision. You have to turn it into action. You have to see change transpire and change come about. And so uh, we have to learn how to turn the vision into action. Chapter 4, Building a Kingdom Dream Team. Communities close to a leader's heart. You'll never be able to effectively fulfill the vision God's given you or effectively minister to the church God's placed you in or effectively minister to the city that God's placed you in if you don't have the right people around you. You have to build a dream team of people in order to, uh, in order to function. And uh, the resource challenge... Uh, the test of a leader's medal. In other words, uh, the way I look at that, just by looking at the title, is there's never enough resources to go around. Uh, if we can only accomplish something based on having enough resources, m most of us will never accomplish much. Because God seldom tells us or asks us to do something that we have the resources to carry out. We have to figure out how to make that happen, and that's the test of a leader's medal. Developing emerging leaders. Chapter 6, when leaders are at their best. As leaders, as pastors, as visionaries, 
we should be building people and building other leaders, seeing it in others and building it. Number seven, discovering and developing your own leadership style. Your own leadership style. Everybody has their own style. There's no two leaders that are the same. And God can use you and your style effectively. And uh, number eight, uh, a leader, and, and well, let's go back to seven. The problem with too many people is they never discover their style. They're always trying to lead based on someone else's style. They're always trying to change their church based on what somebody else did that was effective rather than finding out what God wants this church to do and build on that. Number eight, a leader's sixth sense, the sources of decision-making. Decision-making is vital to the process. If you're not a good decision maker, you're going to have a lot hard time functioning in the kingdom. And, um, and, and uh, some pastors just have a hard time doing that. The art of self-leadership, the 360-degree leader. In other words, leadership isn't just about other people. It starts with you. If you can't lead yourself, how in the world can you lead anybody else? As an example, I, I think I've told many of you this, but I went to a class when I was getting my master's on, uh, and the title of the class was uh, 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 The Servant as Administrator. And I was supposed to be there for three days, all day and all night almost for three days. And, uh, and, and after two and a half days of the instructor dealing with interpersonal issues that we as leaders might have or we need to develop in our lives, he said, now I know you all came thinking you were going to have three days of learning how to budget, staff, you know, all of that. And we said, yeah, but we're glad we didn't. He said, well, here's my, here's the reason we didn't do it that way. He said, now after lunch on this third day, that's what you're going to have. But he said, prior to that, my philosophy is if you can't lead yourself, if you can't administrate yourself, how in the world can you ever administrate the church? And so we need to learn how to lead ourselves. Number 10 is a leader's prayer. Uh, gold mold and shape me to the full leadership potential. So we should be asking God for to to make us great leaders, and in doing so, it's going to uh, or it's, it's God mold and shape me. It's going to mold us and shape us, and sometimes it's going to be painful. It can be painful, and the leader's pathway, which is a vital walk with God. Uh, as a leader, you need to have a pipeline to the Father. You need to have good open communication with God so that he can lead you and guide you and direct you in the ways he wants you to go. And then chapter 12, developing an enduring spirit or staying the course. Uh, that's very vital in today's society when, uh, when uh, so many jump from here to there. Uh, it used to be, and, and I've used this stat for a number of years, I don't know if it's still, I don't think it's probably uh, this low now because uh, pastors don't have to uh, leave churches as often because people do. I mean, people are mobile now. They'll move from California to Florida at the a drop of a hat. But years ago, people didn't move like that. And so there was pastors moving all the time. They'd be in a position for a little while, and then they'd go. And uh, uh, the stat in a year, number of years ago, and I don't know what it is. It's probably higher now. But one, a, a pastor... The average time a pastor stayed at a church was 1.8 months. 1.8 months. One year, eight months, pardon me. It was a year and eight months. And when you couple that with the fact that in most cases, it takes approximately five years for a new pastor to become the pastor, it shows you that we have a dilemma. Uh, churches that are never pastored. Because the pastor's not there long enough to become the pastor, and, uh, and 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 then they get another one, and that's a sad state. So, in order to stay the course, I think there's three things that are vital. If you've been in my classes before, you've heard me say this, but I think that nine, at least ninety percent of the problems that pastors face have to do with these three issues. N number one, not understanding people's personalities. In other words, you deal with people. All the same, not realizing that they have different personalities, they process things differently, they think differently, so they respond differently, and, 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 and they get frustrated because if we don't understand their personality, we've got them in the wrong place. 
and they get frustrated. The second is understanding people's gifts, and it's the same thing. We put If you don't understand the giftings that God gives people, and you don't understand the individual gifts that God has given the people in your congregation, you are going to place them in the wrong place. Frustration is going to ensue. Uh, fruitfulness is not going to happen. Fulfillment in ministry is not going to happen, and, uh, and it's going to go south. And then the third thing is conflict management. That pastors and leaders don't know how to manage conflict conflict effectively. And if you don't know how to manage conflict effectively, you're going to have some problems. So I'm convinced that 90% of uh, uh, the problems that uh, pastors uh, face have to do with a uh, lack of understanding of personalities, gifts, and conflict management. That being said, if you want to be an effective leader, you're going to have to learn. Uh, how to identify personalities. You're going to have to learn how to identify people's gifts and how to manage conflict. You say, well, how in the world do I do that? You go to school to figure it out. You take courses to figure it out. You read books to figure it out. You go to seminars to figure it out. You invest in yourself in those areas so that you can more effectively lead the body. So some good stuff there, and it's going to be very effective as you uh, as you move forward in this class. So uh, so I want you to be reading that the next couple of weeks. I want to talk to you for a minute about, and the things I'm going to talk to you about today are not in your book. Um, um, they're not intended to be. I'm not going to just try to reiterate what your book says. I want you to read it. I want you to interact. We're going to take time for questions, etc. on it. Uh, in fact, let me tell you what I want to do right now uh, before I forget it. I want you to, in the next two weeks, read as much of that book as possible. Please read it all if you can, but at least as much of it as possible. And while you're reading it, I want you to take notes or highlight. Uh, with You know, you can take a pad and, 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 and write notes off of it and meditate on these points, or you can highlight, or you can mark in your book and write questions, etc. And what I want to do within the next two weeks, let's say uh, by, um, uh, let me look at my calendar here. Ah, let me look at my calendar here, uh, do, 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 so we can be on the same page. Um, I want you by, um, uh, this is going to be for uh, the 26th of this class, so that's one, two. Uh, I'd, I'd like to you to by December, uh, pardon me, November 8th, if possible, which is a Sunday night. Uh, by that time, I would, you know, wait, why don't you do it by, uh, let's try to do it by Friday night the 6th, Friday night the 6th, which is, you know, close to two weeks, uh, even if you haven't finished the book, although I'd like for you to by that time, but even if you haven't, by Friday night the 6th, please load, uh, please email me, and email me questions, comments, things you'd like to uh, discuss from your book, uh, things that maybe haven't made sense to you, um, and, and, and you'd, you'd like to get some, you'd like to have some sense made out of it, um, and, um, uh, and, and so I will, uh, and what I'll do is then I'll, I'll uh, take those questions, or those comments, those interaction points, and I'll uh, have another teaching. Uh, video that I will upload to YouTube for you uh, right after that, and I'll answer these questions. I'll engage these concepts. I'll try to give you more input so that so that you're getting input from me personally, but you're also then being able to read the book, uh, interact with it, and then get my input on it so that we can help to grow. And so by that uh, by that Friday, did I say the sixth? I think it was uh, whatever. I think that's what I said. I want you to upload. Uh, questions, comments, engagement points, things you'd like me to approach in another video. And then I can do that and it will help us. It'd be almost be like we're in the class where you're, because uh, uh, I want you to contribute and I want to connect where you need help. And so those areas that you need help, you can, now let's say there's something that you need help on in ministry, life or ministry, family or ministry, that's not in that book. You can put those down too. And I'll approach those in the next uh session. I'll just try to spend some time teaching on those things, and I think that'll be helpful to you. I want to talk to you for a minute about leadership versus pastoring. Leadership versus pastoring. Um, 
I and, and another way I say that is farming versus ranching. Farming versus ranching. You have some farmers out there and you've got some ranchers. What's the difference? The farmer tends one farm of um, five acres, ten acres, forty acres. But then you've got ranchers that have thousands and thousands of acres and they're 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 uh, reaching more, they're taking care of more people and things. And when that happens, when that happens, um, uh, uh, when, when that happens, we're, um, um, how do I want to say this? Um, uh, we're, we're doing more than farming. We're leading. Because in order for a rancher to succeed, he has to have foremen and people under him that he is leading that has more of the hands-on work with the actual cattle and land than he does. Okay, And I think the same thing is true when it comes to farming and when it comes to leadership and pastoring. You have pastors. They're over a flock. Uh, they, they care for them, they feed them, they comfort them, they love them, they help them. And then you have some pastors that are, are leaders. And by being a leader, they do more than feed, care for, and love. They, they stretch them. They make them grow. They get them out of their comfort zone. They have a vision and they're taking them somewhere. And there's a big difference. Now, before I go any further into that, let me say this. There's nothing wrong with either one. We need pastors and we need leaders. Uh, because if you are a leader, you might have good pastoral skills, but you might not. And if you don't have good pastoral skills, God may have called you to be the leader of that ministry, but you need to have some good pastors under you that are being able to pastor the flock and minister to the flock. And so we need both. But what I want you to understand is, let's say you're a pastor. You're not a leader. You're a pastor. And God's placed you in a location there to feed, care for, uh, marry and bury, uh, minister to families. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And that may be what God's called you to, and that may be uh, what he intends for you to do the rest of your life and care for that flock. But... Um, there's also leaders that can't do that because they know that where we are is not good enough. We have to go further. We have to go deeper. We have to go to an, through another direction. And so, so uh, there are both leaders and pastors. And all I'm saying is one's not right and the other wrong. But you need to recognize who you are. If you are comfortable, if you are comfortable in your heart and in your spirit with taking a group of 100 people, let's say, as an example, 50 to 100 people, and, and loving them and caring for them and taking care of them and building them and and they're comfortable in what's happening in the church, that segment's being taken care of and there's nothing the matter with that. But a lot of people can't do that because they know God's got more. They know God wants to stretch the people, grow the people, build the church, change things. And and so and so uh, and so if, if that person is also a pastor, they can both lead and pastor. But if they're not, don't have pastoral skills, they need to have under shepherds. They need to have foremen, in a sense, that are pastors under them, ministering to the people. Uh, so I just want you to know that there is a difference, and that's why you see differences in people. And one is not right and the other wrong. I just wanted to bring that up quickly. And, and some of the things I'm discussing in this in this video, you may want more clarification. That can be part of your email to me as well. So, the second thing I want to talk about today is that there's no one way to lead. There is no one way to lead. Um, uh, oftentimes, you know, we think, well, uh, this is how you do church. Do, 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 do. There's no one way to lead. And uh, uh, so, some of what Bill Hybels will say will minister to you. I'm going to share with you a couple books in a minute of different pastors. Some of what they share will minister to you. Um, there's no one way to lead. And, uh, and, and all you have to do is make sure your heart's right. You're getting the direction from God. You're leading the people the way God wants them. So, so a lot of the stuff uh, are not right and wrong. Now, granted, the motives can be right and wrong, etc. But, um, but there's not just one way to lead. But all leaders 
and I wrote three things down that I think all leaders must do. Not, not necessarily pastors, but leaders. And why do I say not necessarily pastors? Because the pastor's content with where things are. The pastor's fulfilling his calling to take care of 50, 75, 100, 150, whatever the case may be. And, and, and it's, it's, it's effective for that church. It's taking care of a small church in a small town, whatever the case may be. But all leaders, in my opinion, must do these three things. Number one. They must have the courage to take the people where they don't want to go. They must have the courage to take the people where they don't want to go. And um, see, that's the problem with, with, with sheep. Um, they don't want to change. They want to stay the same. They, they, they don't want to go where they've never been before. And in order to lead people, you've got to take them where they've never been before. As in, let me give you a biblical example. A biblical example is from uh, um, uh, the book of Joshua. And uh, the children of Israel had been following, following Moses. And uh, they had followed him and followed him around the mountain, around the mountain, around the mountain, around the mountain for 40 years. And all of a sudden, uh, God says, Moses, my servant, is dead. And he puts uh, an anointing upon Joshua to lead the people into the promised land. And almost immediately, Joshua, he knows where that promised land is. He's been waiting for 40 years to get there. And when God anoints him to take the people, he starts moving the people that direction. No longer are they going around the mountain. They're going a different way. And one of the statements in the book of Joshua is, we've never been this way before. And, uh, and here's the thing with people. A lot of times people don't go want to go where they've never been before. And you have to you have to know what they need and be able to take them where they need to go. And take them where they don't want to go, but you know they need to go. Number two, all leaders must take risks. All leaders must take risks. Um, in other words, you're not going to... to uh, uh, Go to the next level by staying the same. Why? If you do what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always got. If you want something you've never had before, you're going to have to do something you've never done before. And you're going to have to take some risks. Now, I don't believe in taking unnecessary risks. I don't believe in taking risks for the sake of risk. But I do believe that you're never going to get where you need to go without some risks. There's risk involved. Um, risk involved. And, um, and uh, um, that goes along really with number three. Number one was have the courage to take them where they don't want to go. Number two is take risks. And number three is you got to change. You know, take risk and change. They, they go along together. Taking where they don't want to go. They're all really one concept. I just said it in three different ways. You have to get the people out of their comfort zone. People get in a comfort zone and they can't see beyond where they are. That's why a woman who uh, gets delivered out of an abusive marital relationship, oftentimes when she finds another man, guess what? He's an abuser. Why would she go back into the same type of situation? Because even though she doesn't like it, and even though she doesn't want it, she understands it. That's all she knows. She does not understand a healthy relationship. And so she seldom goes where she's never been before. She tends to go back to where she, uh, what she's comfortable with. And, um, and so... Uh, uh, you know, I call it the nest syndrome. We're developed in a nest. And, uh, and, 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 and until we get out of that nest, we think everybody thinks just like we did in that nest, just like we were uh, trained. But you get out of that nest and you realize there are different ways of thinking, there are different ways of ministry, there are different ways of life. Not everybody thinks the same. And so all of a sudden you're charging on and you're so excited about it. But the minute opposition comes, you have a tendency to resort back into your nest and into that way of thinking. 
And so we have to get people out of their comfort zone. And sometimes in order to get people out of their comfort zone, you have to make changes just for that purpose. You have to take some risks just for that purpose. You have to have the courage to make some changes and to take them where they've never been before. Let me give you an example of that, and I'll just share it from my own personal experience. And uh, uh, Lord called me to uh, the church I'm at a little over three and a half years ago and been ministering there and realizing that some changes need to be made if we're going to go to the next level because if you stay the way you are, and if you have, and I'm just using this example, if you have a number of older people and you never get new younger people, in 10 years the church won't exist anymore. So you have to make some changes in order for that not to happen and in order for that, the, ch the change you have to make has to be more appealing to the younger generation which causes some friction with the older generation and so for three years I was talking about we need to make some changes. We're going to have to make some drastic changes. And we made some when I first come in. We made a few more along the way. So we made some changes. But all of a sudden, uh, in the last uh, uh, three months, I'd say it is, three to four months, uh, we changed almost everything. Um, I had a vision Sunday. I shared some of the changes. One of the changes was we changed every department. We changed the leadership in the department. Why? One reason is because we got too comfortable. We were doing the same things. Uh, and when you get comfortable in doing the same things, you don't have any vision to think out of the box or to get new ideas. And so, so now I didn't go to all of those. So I met one on one with all of those department heads, and I didn't say, you did, "You've done a bad job. You're not changing. So I'm going to change you." That's not what I said. Basically, what I said was. Uh, this has served us up to this point, but in order to reach a newer generation, we're going to have to make some changes. And I think one of the changes is, is leadership. In other words, I think we need to get new blood in where you are and put you in new areas because you will have vision and direction for new areas. Others can have vision and direction for where you've been. So we changed all the, the, the heads of our departments. And ha has it put more work on me? Yes. Uh, has it been worth it? Yes. Have we lost attendance in those areas? Um, once in a while, but overall it's been good and, uh, and it's very productive. And so, so on that Vision Sunday, I, I, I honored the people who'd been in the, in the ministries and shared some of the others who were going to be in the new ministries. Um, we we, we uh, made that change. We're changing the name of the church. I haven't shared the name yet, but... Uh, uh, everybody knows it's coming, and, uh, uh, you know, and w w why? Well, because we're not the same anymore. Every time, you look at the Old Testament and even the New Testament, but especially the Old Testament, every time God came on the scene and did a work in a place or a person, a big work in a place or person, almost invariably he changed their names. Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, Saul to Paul. Uh, and even places, uh, and 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 the, you know there were places that 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 are named that for what God did in that place. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord shall provide, and and so so what we want to do is change our name, not based on where we were, but based on where we are. And so the only thing I told the people is I don't have the name yet, seeking God, getting direction, but it will have the word family in it because we want to be a family. Uh, a develop a, 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 a group who develops families and builds families, and so uh, uh, did, was there tension? I wouldn't say there was tension. There might have been tension with a person or two, but overall, everybody knew we needed to do it. But here's the thing: timing is a key. I'm talking to you now about ministry. I'm talking to you about leadership. I'm talking to you about advanced ministerial internship. Timing is just as important as actually what you're doing. I wanted to change the name of the church the day I came in as pastor. But God let me know it wasn't time. In fact, and then we built this sign, never had a sign out there, built this sign, and the day came when we were supposed to put uh, order the lettering for the sign. And I'm thinking, and I found out it was going to be $1,000 for the lettering. And I said, Lord, I don't want to pay $1,000 when I know we're eventually going to change it. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, they're not ready to change it. What's $1,000 to me? In other words, I could have made that change too quick to save a thousand dollars and not been at the church today because of the uproar 
you, 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 timing is vital. So, in fact, uh, I would say that if I were you and I were making notes here for things I'd like to ask to get more info, I might ask something about timing because timing is vital. Um, so those are just a few things all leaders have to do. Courage to take them where they don't want to go. Take risks and change. Get them out of their comfort zone. Okay? Um, we have to realize that we need to change many of our methods to reach today's society. As I said earlier, the society is moving on. The problem with the church is many of them haven't moved on. But the society is moving on. And if we want to be effective, we're going to have to figure out ways to, to um, move, not with the society, but to move in such a way as to still engage them. Because the problem is, if they're moving and we're staying the same, we have lost relevancy. Now, message never changes. Uh, but methods have to change. And we, we have to get to the point when it comes to ministry that we realize that no method should be sacred. No method should be sacred. We have to change many methods for today. Now, as an example, I have two books here that, uh, that I want to bring your attention to. And um, one of them I'm going to... I don't know what happened. I, I lost my photo booth. How did that... Am I still... Taping, yeah, I'm still taping. Somehow I lost my photo booth. Uh, so I think we're still going. It looks like we are. Um, I've got two books here that I really want you to, uh, one of them especially, to purchase. I would if I were you. You don't have to, but for your library. Uh, the other one I think I'm going to uh, encourage you to do, but I just got it yesterday. So I haven't really read it yet. I've just barely been looking at it. I'll know more in a couple weeks. But the first one is a book called The Blessed Church by Robert Morris. The Blessed Church by Robert Morris. Now, some of you will know that Robert Morris is a pastor in the Dallas area, uh, Gateway Church, um, and he's now that's now where uh, the King's University, Jack Hayford School, is headquartered, down there at that church. I think they run something like uh, uh, 36,000 people. Yeah, the back of the book says 36,000 active members, and that was in the girl all the time. That was in, uh, when was that? Uh, this was published in 2012, so they're probably beyond that now, multi-campus uh, church. Um, and it's an excellent book, and he tells in here, in fact, I just taught a King's uh, three-day modular on this subject uh, using his book as one of the main textbooks. And uh, he deals with some things in here because I'm talking about methods have to change. And if you want to have the blessing of God, you have to do things that produce the blessing instead of the curse. Uh, let, me, let me take you very quickly to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Let me take you to Deuteronomy chapter 30, I believe it is. And uh, I want to read something to you here along that line that uh, I think is vital. Uh, verse uh, uh, 18, um, well, let's, let's start with verse 15. Of Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. I see I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, and that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away, and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you, cr which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. He says, I call heaven and earth as witness today against you, that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your seed may live. God has set before us the opportunity to be blessed or cursed. 
based on the decisions we make and the direction we go. And so his whole book is about attempting to do things as a pastor to bring blessing to him and his church instead of cursing. And um, uh, it's an excellent book. In fact, it's so excellent, I'm thinking about getting one for every family of our church. And he talks first about the gateway story, the story there at the church and how they started and, and how God blessed them. And then he goes into part two, which is called The Blessed Vision. And he talks about vision and, um, and articulating it and writing it down and the vision that they have as a church. It's a very good section. Part three is Blessed Shepherds. Blessed Shepherds. Let me give you some of the topics that he deals with. Leading is not an option. To feed and lead. Good shepherds, false shepherds, and hirelings. The true shepherds call. The shepherd loves the sheep. Your first and most important ministry. And then he goes to part four, which is blessed leaders. Who is the minister here? The pastor's three-part job description. The prayer of the burned-out pastor. Eagle's nest empowerment. The vital key to being an empowering leader. And then part five is blessed government. Church government matters. The gateway approach to church government. Healthy tension, a healthy pastor, healthy spiritual elders, the pastor-elder relationship, staff, non-staff, and apostolic elders. And then the blessed church culture. Talks about the power of culture. You have to have a culture of generosity, a culture of freedom, a culture of rest, a culture of worship, and a culture of community. So, um, so we just have to realize that uh, that um, uh, God wants to bless us as His people. But in order for for the church to be blessed, the, the shepherds have to be blessed, and the leaders have to be blessed, and the government and the church culture, and. Uh, he has some very interesting stuff on church government in here, because I think that's one of the biggest problems with many churches. And we're talking about advanced ministerial internship, learning how to govern the church correctly. And so it's an excellent book. I'm not going to go into the concepts in it this session, uh, but uh, I think uh, you owe it to yourself to get a copy of that book. It would be very beneficial. And then the other book, the one I just got yesterday, I saw it advertised, and I thought, boy, this really sounds good. It's called Clear the Stage, Making Room for God by Scott Wilson and John Bates. Clear the Stage, Making Room for God by Scott Wilson and John Bates. And um, let me read the, the back book here. Um, you want your church to thrive and grow and be all it can be in Christ, but something seems to be standing in the way. Could that something be you? Join Scott as he shares the journey God led him on with the help of his good friend John Bates to step out of the way and let God lead the Oaks. Scott had to clear the stage of all the props, plans, and programs and hand it all over to the Holy Spirit. That's when things got interesting. A deep spiritual awakening and renewal came to the Oaks, but not before renewal came to Scott. If you play it safe, you'll miss out on the adventure of seeing God enter your life and your ministry in a way you've never experienced before. If you're willing to clear the stage in your leadership to make room for the Holy Spirit, He will do wonders in and through you. Looks like a very easy read and a very interesting read. Um, and uh, by, by just stopping some of the things we do to find out where God's going. God spoke to me one time years ago and He said, How about just seeing where I'm going and follow me? And I thought, what a novel idea. And so I'm very interested in this book. I think it will be very beneficial. I'll have more information on it in a couple of weeks. But uh, I just want you to, uh, to, to, to bond you aware of those. And that brings me to another point. When it comes to being a blessed pastor, when it comes to uh, leading the church, leading your family, you have to be a lifelong learner. Why did I order that book a couple days ago? Because it seemed like it had something that would help me where I am. And you have to be a lifetime learner. You have to always realize you don't know it all. You can grow some more. There's changes you need to make and take. And, um, and so you just, you just keep growing. So, so uh, just some thoughts. Now, go with me to the book of Ephesians. 
I want us to go to Ephesians. I'm just about through for this lecture, and um, and uh, I want to read something here, talk about it for just a minute, and then we will we will um, uh, conclude in a few minutes here. Ephesians four. This is our job as pastors and as leaders, starting with verse seven of Ephesians four. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of God's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself, God himself, gave some to be apostles some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. For what purpose? Verse 12. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. That's our purpose. That's our reason for being. Equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, to edify the body of Christ, Till we become who God's called us to become. And here's my point. If in your life and ministry that's not been happening the way you'd like to see it happen, then you need to make some changes. Because if what you were doing was going to work, it would already be working. And if it's not working, there's a reason for it, and you need to apply yourself to see change come. So my prayer for us during this, this uh, journey, and I've been teaching a little over 50 minutes now, about 52 minutes. My prayer for us over this journey is that we, we change, we get out of our comfort zone, we learn how not to... Um, make things sacred that are just methods. We search our heart, our motive, and we become the kind of men and women that can effectively engage our culture. And so I want to encourage you in the next five weeks to, as you read your book and as you write down these comments and get them back to me in a couple weeks so that I can give you another video and we can talk these things through. I want us to to meditate, to, to change, to see what's not working, to see what can work, to, you know, and uh, and what we may do is after, uh, you know, it, it's a five-week course, and so maybe towards the end, we'll just see. Maybe we'll meet together one day if, if we're able, or all of us that can. Um, I'm not sure yet, but, uh, you know, we can meet at a Starbucks or something and finish off the class. Uh, we'll just see how it goes, uh, but... But I'm here for you. I'm here to bless you and minister to you and help you, even by being transparent about the mistakes I have made and still make, because I'm here to help you become what God's called you to become. So let me pray with you and believe God for his blessing on your life. Lord, I pray for these men and women. May your hand of blessing and anointing be upon them, and may you use them in a mighty way. Touch them, Holy Spirit, in a way that would honor you and glorify you. Bless them, I pray, and give them your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's what I want you to do. Uh, be reading your book. Uh, if I were you, I would really order the Blessed Church, be reading that as well, but uh, from your notes on this lesson, from your notes, from your reading, from other things in life and ministry, by that Friday in a couple weeks, uh, uh, email me, uh, questions or things you'd like more input on or um, whatever. And I'm here to help you grow and minister. You know what your assignment is. If you need help on that, email me about that. 
and uh, we're just going to move forward in faith. So God bless you and have a great day.